Hello. Hey. How are you? Good. How are you? I am doing well. Thanks for uh, willing to do this. Uh, you're very welcome. So I could just, uh, it's not only focused on Fire Emblem, I can focus on other, other things too. Sure. Sounds good to me. So in terms of a uh, voiceover, was uh, everything started with the Rolling Rock beer commercial? Yeah. Yeah, you've done your homework. Yeah. Uh, I'm assuming you saw that online somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, actually, that was my very first professional voiceover. Was that also how you got into SAG, too? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And was there any, um, like, initial aspiration to try and pursue, like, live action stuff? Yeah, I had uh, gotten my start uh, in New York. Right after I graduated from college, I moved to New York City and, and uh, lived in Manhattan. And um, I did a lot of theater, a lot of off-Broadway and uh, and uh, in theater like that, I, did, I started doing a lot of stand-up comedy and sketch comedy. And uh, uh, and doing that stand-up and sketch comedy, I did, did some TV appearances. I had some bit parts on like All My Children and shows like that, soap operas. And um, uh, yeah, and then uh, I was it was one of my sketch comedy and, and stand-up comedy shows that uh, I was doing a bit where I was making fun of TV commercials. And that was where the voiceover agent saw me and uh, and invited me in uh, to come and audition for voiceover and and uh, yeah, that's how I got my my start. How soon after that did you move to LA? It was a it was a few years. I I stayed in New York and I worked for a number of years um, doing voiceover. The most of the voiceover that I did in uh, in New York was for commercials and things like that. But I did start into animation. Like there was a animated series on MTV um, back in the day called Celebrity Deathmatch. Mm-hmm. And I, there was, uh, and it was kind of like a parody. They did parody of uh, pop culture at the time. And there was a TV show called The Real World uh, that was popular back then. Uh, and there was a San Francisco. They just did, it was based on the city or whatever. And there was Real World San Francisco. And one of the more well-known characters on that show was called Puck. And so I did the voice for Puck in the Celebrity Deathmatch uh, show back then. That's when I started doing, uh, started getting into animation. And then, uh, um, so I was in New York for a few years after I started doing voiceover professionally before I moved to Los Angeles. And then I know, uh, Steve Bloom suggested for you to get into anime. He did. Yeah. He and I shared the same agent and, uh, anybody who knows Steve Bloom will, will tell you the same thing that I'm about to say about him, that he's one of the most genuine and kind individuals that you'll ever meet. And so he and I very quickly became friendly with each other, uh, as we continued to see each other and get to know each other over over the number of years uh, in Los Angeles um, before he actually made that recommendation. So uh, I had known him for a couple of years before he actually said, hey, man, have you ever tried this? And I was like, no, and he was like, oh, you should try this. Give it a shot. Did you uh, take the dubbing pretty easy or was it still difficult to get used to? It was challenging in the beginning. I started off and and I had had years at this point, years and years of experience of doing voiceover work, but um, dubbing is is different. It's technically ADR. Yeah. And uh, so you're dubbing over an existing product, uh, which is an animation for anime or even in many cases, live action. And it was something that I had no experience in, even though I had been a professional voice actor at that point for years. So it took me um, a little bit of getting used to, but I was able to quick it up, uh, pick it up pretty quickly. And I would guess that uh, Vaughn and Gunsword was your first like big part. Yeah, yeah I have uh, Liam O'Brien, who is now famous for um, a Critical Role and a lot of other things uh, uh, that uh, I have him to thank for that. I was actually... Uh, uh, friends and acquaintances with, with him in my New York days. And uh, so I knew him and and we ran with a big circle of friends um, that we were all friends with. And uh, he actually introduced me to the production company that was doing Gun Sword. And, um, and he directed me in that series. Uh, so I won the role. And, uh, and it was great because um, it was my first leading role in an anime. And then getting to work with Liam, I think, in that anime, for me, was just very special because he's, he's a, also excellent human being. And, but also because 
I was able to engage with him just because we we uh, we knew each other, you know, uh, in prior to. And so he was able to really engage with me. And, and we took our time and really crafted that character and, and his voice and how that came out. So he's just a great director, too. So, yeah. Did you find it easy to uh, relate to Vaughn? Yeah, I think the character is just awesome. You know, I mean, I, I think it's just a cool character. I've I I really embraced the, the character and the show. I thought uh, it was I was I really wish that it had gotten more wide um, adoption. Uh, you know, as far as the release goes, but uh, I just think it's a great, it's a hidden gem as far as I'm concerned. As far as the series, it's 26 episodes of just fun mm-hmm. and uh, and a fun fact about that anime series. Um, I used that. There's a show, uh, a scene in the very first episode where my character Vaughn is down on one knee talking to a female character in front of a church. And uh, Liam O'Brien and I crafted together. We worked out uh, my proposal uh, to my then girlfriend, my now wife. Uh, um, and I redubbed in my proposal and then I took that and I, I played that, uh, to my girlfriend and proposed to her. Oh, wow. And, uh, and the, the, the Japanese production caught wind of it and they liked it so much that they actually included my proposal to my wife as a, uh, DVD extra. Oh, <laughs> copy the DVD. You can watch me propose to my wife. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, in terms of your longer running, like bigger characters, who do you think that you relate the most to then? Um, I think that, um, who I relate to the most, I don't know, like as a, as a individual and as a human being, I mean, the characters, the the biggest characters that I've known for, I would say I wouldn't necessarily relate to because they can be kind of jerks, (laughs) uh, you know, like Gilgamesh, uh, or, or, Grim Jow or characters like that. I love those characters to death. I think they're incredible. As far as who I would relate to, maybe Martial Law from Tekken. Um, okay. He was, uh, he's loosely based on Bruce Lee, uh, who was my childhood hero growing up. And and uh, I just was always a huge fan of uh, Bruce Lee. We're going back to the timeline. Um, I know, of course, you got involved in the Fate series pretty early on with playing Assassin in the first, yeah. first season. Yeah. Yeah. I started off playing assassin and I think it was Grant George, uh, who is another terrific actor, uh, was playing Gilgamesh in that very, very first, uh, iteration of it. And then, um, after that, when fate zero came out, I came in and I started, I started, uh, took over the role of Gilgamesh archer slash Gilgamesh. And, um, I've been Gilgamesh ever since. Do you have a like single favorite moment you think throughout the entirety you've been playing? I do I do? There is a moment uh, in Fate Zero, and I don't want to give away any spoilers, um, so I won't give away a spoiler. But it's between uh, the character Kire Kotumine uh, and Gilgamesh, and they are in. I think I don't remember the building that they're in, but it's this really intimate moment between he and uh, and Kire, where there's this incredible tension uh, going on between the two of them. And uh, I, I again, I don't want to give away any spoilers, but it's, it's in the Fate Zero series. Um, so if you are um, if you haven't been introduced to the Fate series, you are in for a treat. And it's Ufotable that did the animation uh, for that series, and it is some of the most gorgeous animation uh, of its time. I mean, it came out ten years ago, um, but uh, the animation is phenomenal. Kide Kotamine is uh, one of my other favorite characters, and Crispin Freeman is the voice actor who plays uh, Kide. And um, and I, I think also just because I personally, I know Crispin, I love Crispin, and um, just that banter back and forth between those two characters for me, I just I love to watch it. Mm-hmm. When you when you go to cons and stuff too, uh, is there like a single favorite line for Gilgamesh that you find people yes. ask for the most? <laughs> Everybody wants me to call them a mongrel, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm happy to do so. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything? I mean, even though he's so much different than yourself, like, is there anything that you can relate to him about? Um, you know, I, I think that uh, what I would say is, I, I certainly don't think everybody around me are mongrels, and I certainly don't think that I'm better than everybody else, like Gilgamesh does, <laughs> but. I think that um, how I can, re- I would relate to him, uh, you know, as a, on an individual basis is that uh, I think that 
he has vision and he wants to see things done his way. And I think I'm very similar that way. Um, mm -hmm. I have big picture vision of how I want things to be done. And, and I tend to go after them the same way that, uh, that Gilgamesh does. Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of uh, anime, what do you think the darkest headspace you've had to go for a character is? That's a good question. And I have gone into, I mean, a lot of the characters that I've done have been pretty zany, like, um, Send cats and kill a kill and in shows like that. I'm trying to think of some place that uh, that there's a dark Gilgamesh that goes pretty dark uh, in a lot of ways. Also, um, Esterosa in Seven Deadly Sins, yeah, can go to some pretty in Mael, uh, can can had had gone to some pretty dark places too. So yeah. Well, one of my favorite characters of yours. It's not dark at all, but uh, Chester in the in the tales. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Esther Barclight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's one of the most like it's it, I loved playing that character, but it's so funny. Um, it's one of the most forgotten characters because not too many people have seen Tales of Fantasia. But uh, but yeah, it's a great, uh, really, really great uh it's a, I think it's an OVA. Yeah, Chester Barclight. Uh again, one of the early, early anime characters that I that I voiced. I think he was probably the second or third voice uh, character that I voiced in an anime series. Oh, okay. Well, then I know uh, after that was Code Code Geass and Blue Dragon, stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, Code Geass. Um, Code Geass. That was a great one. And that was actually directed by the late, great Kevin Seymour. Mm -hmm. And Kevin Seymour directed me in my very first dubbing site. Here's all this, like, trivial fun facts. So... Kevin Seymour, um, Steve Bloon introduced me to a number of people when he introduced me into the world of anime. Kevin Seymour was one of those people. And Kevin Seymour brought me in to do my first dubbing minor characters, which are called incidentals, because uh, we wanted to get to know each other. And, and um, so he's like, come in and I'm going to have you voice in a few things. And Kevin Seymour, uh, I came in and I was kind of arrogant because I had been doing professional voiceover for a number of years. Never done an anime, never done an ADR. So I came in, and uh, we start we start the the session. And there's a series of uh, how it works is there's a series of beeps, and then you right. dub over the voiceover. I had no idea what I was doing, so <laughs> we get ready to do to do our first take, and and the, the series of beeps go off, and I'm like standing there, and Kevin's like, "Okay, Dave, here's how everything works," you know. And he he really walked me through the process, and and again, uh, you know, God rest his soul, just a kind, kind human being. Uh, but at any rate, Kevin Seymour, I digress. Kevin Seymour directed me in um, Code Geass, mm -hmm. and uh, again, just a delightful human being. That's one of the the I think the best parts about working in this industry are just the people that you get to work with. I work with a lot of the nicest people um, that you could that you could work with. Tony Oliver had a great a great saying to me um and and he said this and i've never forgotten it and he's like it, it is so insanely competitive to do what we do and he said it is you cannot be a jerk and work in this industry it's too competitive um people want to work with people that they want to work with and so um, that's been one of the the most delightful aspects about being a part of this business is you really do get to know some of the the most wonderful and, and fun individuals mm -hmm. Was there a special story of how you got involved with a uh, Blaze Blue, or is it pretty general? Man, Blaze Blue was one of those happy surprises that came that comes in your that come in your career once in a while. Blaze Blue, I I vaguely remember auditioning for it. Um, maybe I auditioned for it, maybe I didn't, but I just got. I remember getting the call. Hey, we have a booking for you, and um, it's uh, this video game called blaze blue and i believe it was christy reed who directed the first calamity trigger i think was the first version that i recorded on and then it was patrick seitz yeah and patrick seitz um is he's just one of my favorite human beings on planet earth but um i remember going in and this character jin kisaragi and just is this batshit crazy insane character with his whenever he interacts with his bro brother Ragna the Blood Edge who, who uh, coincidentally is also voiced by Patrick Seitz 
Um, and just that whole story arc and that interaction between those two characters, for me, I loved so much just because I got to take Jin Kisaragi into these insane scenarios over the course. Uh, I mean, we recorded on that. I recorded on that series for years and years and years. And um, that to me was just a load of fun because that character had so many levels to him on just craziness. Badass. He was crazy. Uh, it was just a lot of fun to do him. He's great. Mm -hmm. I take it you have more affinity to, for him than uh, Hakuman. Hakuman mm -hmm. is great. I love Hakuman on a physical level. He's very tough to voice because he's down here as Hakuman, you know, and you do that for four hours straight. You're just like, you're spent by the time. I love the character. I think he's a great character. And uh, and he's got great uh, that great saying that he does uh, the I am the white void yeah uh, to me is just one of my favorites too I I love that character I love them both uh, I I think they're a lot of fun Jin I think I have a little more fun with with just his insane uh in, and he's got a little more humor to him than uh, than Hakuman does um, and coming from a comedy background I always I always like playing up the the comedy but I love them both Blaze Blue is just an incredible series mm -hmm. well. Touching on what you just said, uh, vocally speaking, what do you think the most, or the cases where you've had to alter your voice the most for a character? Hakuman. Uh, Hakuman is a um, definitely a tough one. I did a, uh, that one was was challenging, I'll say that. But then there was a um, character that I did for a small anime um, called Hyperdimension Neptunia. Yeah. I played this character, Anana Death, who is this fabulous android robots <laughs> and he's when i say fabulous i mean fabulous just to the, this type of a character yeah and so that one um uh was i was directed by oh god he's incredibly well known funimation director and I, I again just a fantastic guy um and why his name is slipping my mind at the moment mike mcfarland Mm -hmm. uh, Mike McFarland, um, you know, just this pro prolific talent and director. And uh, he and I just had a great time uh, with that character because it was just so obnoxious. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just one of those animes where you get to be super obnoxious and, and just be crazy. So it was a lot of fun. Do you think you have a, a preference for working on more dramatic series as opposed to comedic? Or I'm a big fan of comedy. Um, that was, I did a lot of comedy in New York. And so that's where I really cut my teeth. And so I think that, um, that doing the comedy and that, I think that's a lot of the reason why I like series, why I liked, uh, Kill a Kill. I played Senkets, who's the, the uniform, the, the sentient talking uniform and for Ryuko. And so like, like that's, I, I enjoyed that show so much and I enjoyed that because of the comedy in it and there was so much comedy and there were so many funny moments and then one piece uh is uh, another one i played this character duval and joel mcdonald uh directed me in that and again just this incredible director that i got we laughed our asses off the entire time we recorded that because it's just so funny i had no idea that one piece was hysterical because mm -hmm. i never really watched it i just was familiar with it because you see it everywhere and but when I actually worked on the series, and I know that there's like a gazillion episodes, but when I worked on the series, like it was to me like I, I was introduced to just the sheer comedy of it, you know, like what a funny show and how much how much just humor is in there and smart humor, uh, and I love smart humor and I love zany humor, and so I think I, I think that I'm inclined to say that I'm I'm attracted to the the comedy, but I also like. I love the drama of like a Gilgamesh or a Grimjow Jagger Jack, you know, and like that, those to me are just awesome. They're so much fun. Do you uh, tend to consume very many of the series that you're part of too, or? If I get the chance, man, I'm so stinking busy with the, uh, with work and, and I've, I've got a family, you know, and so I've got a, a, a nine-year-old and, and so she keeps me on my toes and busy. So, um, but I, I engage as much as I can. Mm -hmm. Were you uh, aware of anime at all prior to getting into it? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I had grown up watching like Star Blazers and uh, all of the, the old classics uh, from when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. 
Well, talking about a uh, bleach, um, I don't know how much you know about like what Grimjow does in the new series yet, but I'm sure that's been great to come back. Yeah, yeah, I can't speak too much about it yet because <laughs> I don't know what I can and can't say. Yeah, I'll say that. Um, <laughs> I'll, that's all I can say about bleach. <laughs> I don't know what I can and can't say. I don't know. I can, yeah. <laughs> let's hold off on um on anything bleach related um until i'll have more answers for you forthcoming um but i don't have i can't speak to anything right now okay well also talking on um castlevania too was that another just like general audition yeah castlevania was just a general audition and typically what will happen is you don't know what you're auditioning for because they won't yeah. tell you um, they'll just have a character, they'll give you the character traits and blah, 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 and you go in and audition for it. And Castlevania was a, um audition that I don't recall knowing that I was auditioning for Castlevania. It wasn't until I got cast. Uh, then I realized that, oh, I'm Richter Belmont. Great. You know, then I got super excited by it. Mm-hmm. Is he another one that you can uh, easily relate to or is it harder? Yeah, I mean, to me, I just, again, I look at the franchise. The The character, I think, is great. I don't, you know, know if I align with him and, and I'm going to be like, uh, you know, share a lot of character traits with him. Um, you know, he's heroic. Uh, I, I just think that uh, Richter Belmont is a, in the franchise of, of Castlevania is, pardon me, just a phenomenal franchise that I'm honored to be a part of. Mm-hmm. I think uh, for me, too, again, one of my favorite characters of yours is uh, Elliot. And Dead or Alive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Elliot from Dead or Alive 5, uh, to be specific. Yeah, uh, just great character. Those were the heydays. I remember uh, recording on that. That was Jonathan Klein um, that cast me in that uh, in that video game series. Uh, great, great franchise. Great character. And then with, so then with, with Fire Emblem 2, because um, it was Awakening first? Yeah, yeah, it was Awakening was when I first got cast as Fire in Fire Emblem. Fire Emblem is an interesting one to me because I uh it's funny because my my convention agent I, I'm I'm in I'm at I'm in Miami right now for um that's why I've got the hotel background. Um I'm in a Miami for a convention and I was with downstairs with my agent last night and we were talking about um different roles and we were talking about like you just you never know what a role is gonna do when you're when you're auditioning or when you're booked, when you booked it, you have no idea whether it's going to be, um, you know, notable or not. And so when I auditioned, I remember auditioning for Fire Emblem. It, I had never heard of it. And then I remember when I booked it, I was like, oh, groovy. And it was, I think I recorded it in 30 minutes or less. Awakening. And I completely forgot about it. And um, it wasn't until I started going to conventions uh, about three or four months after the game came out. Uh, and then everybody at my autograph table was bringing me Fire Emblem that I was like, oh, what is this? And then so I learned about it. So I then I went back and I was like, I got to learn about this game. Well, then I come to find out that Fire Emblem, that, that Awakening was like, it was, a, it was a, an existing franchise and that Awakening was essentially going to be the last, you know, the last hurrah for the franchise and if if it wasn't a success they were just going to discontinue the franchise at least that's what i was told and um and i could be wrong on that so don't quote me i'm not the source of uh, of god on that one but that's what i had had learned that's what i had been told is that awakening was was kind of the last shot that the fire emblem franchise was going to get and if it wasn't successful they were just going to abandon the franchise and awakening came out and was such a hit uh, that now we've got, you know, uh, Three Houses and like all of these other iterations and Fire Emblem continues to just be this juggernaut of a franchise that I have continued to enjoy reprising my role as Robin and Grimma Robin and and um, uh, and whatnot for a decade plus now, which has been incredible for me. Uh, what, a, what a joy uh, to be able to re- reprise that character and continue to play him. And then, you know, Fire Emblem uh, got picked up by the the Smash Brothers franchise. Uh, and so did Richter Belmont for that matter. And so, uh, yeah, so I mean, Fire Emblem was just such a, 
an incredible win. And, and come to find out in the Awakening franchise is that they had three male Robin voices to choose from. And um, mine became the default voice. And so it was just one of those things where the stars aligned and that character, you know, I just luckily became the default voice for the, the Robin character and um, that the fans were able to choose. And, and then uh, by default, I became the, the Robin voice. So um, what a great ride it's been with, uh, with Fire Emblem. Do you think you have a favorite um, incarnation of Robin that you've gotten to play? My gosh, there are so many different arcana- incarnations. <laughs> um, Grimma Robin, I think, is fun. Um, he's just odd and and different. Uh, I like all all of them. I, I mean, there's not one I can I can really pick out. I love his catchphrase, "Time to tip the scales." Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, for me, it's uh, it's it's fun having a catchphrase like that. You you would never think that "Time to tip the scales" or, or "I'm always three steps ahead" or whatever it is that he says. You know, um, that you just continue to 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 be able to embrace that and then deliver that line in fun new ways so was uh mccallus and heroes just given to you it was yeah yeah it was part of uh well oftentimes what will happen is is in a franchise or in a series like that they'll um they'll introduce a character and then they uh, they'll have that actor come in and 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 voice that what that's what happened with mccallus one of my favorite things about heroes is the uh the like evil sides of characters that you get to play because i know robin had the like an evil skin yeah <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely I, I love taking a new angle uh, for those characters you know and and robin is not an evil character but then getting to play him evil is just for me as an actor it's just fun mm-hmm. and then this was another uh you got to play the uh the villain in one of the other tales games uh richard Richard in Tales of Graces. Yes. yes. Sorry, hang on. That was a super fun game to play. And again, what was interesting about that one is that I recorded on that. I think I recorded over 3,000 lines. Oh, wow. For Richard in Tales of Graces. So that one took weeks of recording, um, which was great um, because you're getting paid that, that entire time. So that was... Uh, yeah, it was, I think it was three weeks of recording. Uh, it was a ton of lines. And um, and again, you know, it's one of those things where I, at, the, at that point in time, I was also working on another video game that I worked on for a year. Uh, and it was called Disaster Day of Crisis. Um, never saw the light of day in North America. It oh. was only released, it was supposed to be the biggest uh, RPG player game in uh for the nintendo wii uh and that video game uh, it was i mean the amount of hype behind it was incredible and then it just went and then what was so interesting is that tales of graces was another i was working on those simultaneously uh during that same time time frame and even though like i recorded three thousand lines for tales of graces it was for for the the amount of hype behind Tales of Graces versus um, this other game, Disaster, uh, at least internally, Disaster was supposed to be this huge thing, and it fizzled, and then Tales of Graces blew up and became uh, uh, Richard is one of another one of my characters that I'm most known for. Mm-hmm. Well, and then a little while after that, you started playing uh, in uh, Dorara. Yeah, Jarara Seiji, the fifteen-year-old in love with a disembodied head. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a that's a that was a super fun series. And Kari Walgren, I thought, did a great job as um, uh, I can't remember her character in that, but she just did a great job. Super fun series. And then you had a uh, multiple characters in Hunter Hunter, too. Yeah, yeah. the The main character that I play in Hunter Hunter is Finks. Yep. Uh, and um, then there was another one called Rabbit Dog that I played, which was a super fun voice that I got to use for that guy. Um, but I think he was only in like one episode. Um, but yeah, Finks, Hunter Hunter. Uh, and I actually got to direct uh, the Hunter Hunter movie that came out a couple years ago or two or three, four years ago. Um, so I got to direct that, the, the movie, which was super fun. 
and uh, voice directed, I should say. And uh, yeah, Hunter Hunter, uh, again, you know, one of the one of the more fun uh, franchises that I've been privileged to work on. Well, speaking of directing, um, was that something that you always wanted to do? It is. Um, it is something that I've I have done for a long time. And then in uh, the voiceover directing, I can't even remember how I got introduced to it. Yeah, I think it was. Um, Uh, Bang Zoom it was a, is a studio that I work with often um, and I love them to death and they gave me a shot. I, I don't remember the show that I directed. I think maybe they brought me in to direct, co-direct or something like that, a couple of episodes. And then um, I started directing for them uh, quite a bit. I love to direct. <laughs> uh, it is something that I am. I, I, I think I, I just enjoy it immensely. Um, I enjoy working with the talent and the actors and in and, um, and crafting the characters' voices and story arcs and things like that. Um, I love it. Um, I've just been so busy. I haven't been able to do it uh, for the past year and a half. Um, I've just, my schedule has been so insane that I haven't had the opportunity to to do it. But when my schedule slows down, I think that I would like to see uh, myself directing more as well. Is there a special story of, um, cause I know that you got to direct uh token Rambu. That's a, that's a really cool show. Yeah. Token Rambu was, um, was really fun. I got to direct. Uh, I mean, it was Robbie Damon, Ben Diskin. I, it was just a, an all-star cast and um, it was uh, bang zoom was the studio that, um, that, um, that dubbed it. And, uh, Bang Zoom is just a, they're such a great company to work with. Um, uh, and I, I just enjoyed it immensely. And Ben Diskin sticks out in my mind. Uh, a fun story to work with him, with his character is, uh, and he's just got this sound to his voice uh, and the characters that he brings that's just fun to listen to. And so um, working with Ben sticks out in my mind, Zach Aguilar. Um, was introduced to him in that series, working with him, and he's just a terrific dude. Uh, yeah, it's just been... Uh, Token Rambu was a great series. I love that series. Mm -hmm. I wish I got more play. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was a good one. And when you... Since you've been uh, narrating the JoJo series for a long time, too, was that also just given to you? Yeah, I mean, yes and no. No, I, I auditioned for it. Um, I auditioned for a number... I remember I auditioned for, like, Dio and but then like Patrick Seitz got it right and so yeah. like and listening to Patrick Seitz's Dio I'm like oh shit he should fucking <laughs> play Dio because he's perfect for it you know and that's kind of like the fun part about this is like I had my idea an idea in my mind how I would approach Dio but then seeing how he does it I'm like oh he does it perfect and so um the narrator uh, for for JoJo's, um, I did audition for it, and I did have a idea in my head about how I would want that narrator. And what I love about what the Japanese narrator does um, is he just comes in out of the fucking blue, and you're, you're just like, what? And so, and that's the approach that I took when I auditioned for the narrator for JoJo. And uh, yeah, thankfully, I've been able to uh, to narrate that entire series. Mm -hmm. How about when, because uh, I know most most recently, um, like Stray Dogs and then Jujutsu Kaisen are really big roles for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, Bungo Stray Dogs. Uh, I don't know what I can and can't say about Bungo, but uh, Bungo, um, I play Sonosuke, Oda Sonosuke, I think yep. is the name of the character. And um, uh, that is a Studiopolis uh, project that, I'm work that I work with them on. And... They're fantastic. Jujutsu Kaisen, same thing. Jujutsu Kaisen is one of the things that got handed to me. And it's because um, it was the casting director was like, hey, this character, David Vincent, is going to be perfect to play this character. That that very rarely happens. Um, it almost never happens, but it, it happens very occasionally. And when it does happen, um, I'm so immensely grateful for it. Uh, and I expressed my gratitude to them because um, I think that Jujutsu Kaisen is such a, a, an incredible franchise um, to be invited to participate in. But then also Kento Nanami uh, is just an incredible character. So I was just thrilled 
Uh, and I got to work with Michael Sorich, was the director, the voice director on that franchise. We recorded that at the height of COVID. And um, and I recorded that out of my wife's closet uh, <laughs> as a little fun fact. Um, but what a great franchise, man. Uh, I, I love that show. And he's a fun character. Mm-hmm. Well, do you have any uh, like funny stories about Michael Sorich? Because I've done him too. I know that he's hilarious. <laughs> he's terrible. Michael Sorich is just a cool dude, man. Um, I don't, I'm trying to think, you know, he honestly, I don't have anything like off the top of my head that I can think about other than just like what a kind human being he is. I know that like one of the things that I admire about him is he's so passionate about um, disc golf. Yeah. And he uh, is just really engaged in that. And that is something that I admire as somebody who's got a passionate thing that they do outside of work uh, to me is just phenomenal. And um, and I loved listening to him tell stories about disc golf. And I think just like stories that in general that he can say, because he's been in this industry for ages and that what he has seen and done and 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 worked on and uh, is just really fun to listen to. So anytime I get to 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 work with Michael Sorich, I'm all ears because I know that I'm going to get a good story. Mm-hmm. Well, going back, I know uh, one of the more recent things that you've gotten to work on too with the Fate series is the Fate Grand Carnival, which is really fun. Fate Grand Carnival, yeah, absolutely. The, uh, that one where Gilgamesh kind of is overseeing things. Uh, yeah. yeah, Fate Grand Carnival, uh, super fun. And then there's also, and I don't know if you're getting ready to ask me this, I don't want to take the wind out of your sails, but there was, there's another iteration of Fate coming out. Yeah. Uh, it was announced publicly, so I'm pretty sure I can talk about it, um, but I think it got delayed uh, in Japan. Mm-hmm. Fate, st- Fate, Fake Strange or something like that? Yeah, Fate called? Strange Fake. Yeah. Fate Strange Fake, yeah. So um, all I can say is, uh, is that there, it was announced publicly uh, that I would be uh, coming back as Gilgamesh. Um, and that's basically all I know. Um, okay. from what I understand is I think that there was a delay in production in Japan is what I'm guessing. So mm-hmm. but I have not started working on that yet. Well, is there anything else that's upcoming that you're part of you can safely talk about? That I can safely talk about. Um, that's the key issue. Um, I don't think I have anything that I can safely talk about unfortunately um there was a show called platinum end that i did cannot remember the name of the character that i did but uh, and i don't think platinum end got a ton of play either i'm I'm trying to think of anything that i can talk about at this point in time um i don't think i can uh about anything that i'm working on at the moment so well my final question is always asking uh, what do you want your legacy to be I think that uh, my legacy, what I would like to see is um, my legacy would be is uh, is about the people. I think that the people is uh, is what I'm about. It's it's the the characters and the and the the joy that I get from from you know breathing life into the characters is is super important to me. But I think over the past twenty plus years I've been in this industry, for me one of the most rewarding aspects about this has been the fandom and the, the, the privilege and the opportunity to engage the fans uh, and to celebrate these uh, works of art with the fans together. To me, that would be my legacy is, um, is I think introducing new ways to, to celebrate that joy together, not, not just with the actors, but also with the audience. Well, I can glad that we got to do this. What's that? Thanks. I'm glad that we got to do this. Yeah, absolutely, man. It is my pleasure. Have a good rest of your day. Awesome, man. All right. Thanks. Great to chat with you.